well, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for coming. This is great. And, and um, I, I love question and answers. You know, I love this. I love the possibility of interaction, especially um, when I'm a little bit off my turf. You know, <laughs> somebody might say something that really enlarges my thinking. So, um, in any case, I'm going to start out by reading from the title essay of the new book of, of essays. I um, then will read at somewhat greater length from Gilead. I, um, People seem to be paying attention to that right now because of the Guardian and so on. So I thought, you know, give old John Ames his voice. <laughs> so this is, uh, when I was a child, I read books, and it's more autobiographical than it's ordinary, than it's normal for me to be. Not very. <laughs> when I was a child, I read books. My reading was not indiscriminate. I preferred books that were old and thick and hard. I made vocabulary, vocabulary lists. Surprising as it may seem, I had friends, some of whom read more than I did. I knew a good deal about Constantinople and the Cromwell Revolution and chivalry. There was little here that was relevant to my experience, but the shelves, shelves of northern Idaho groaned with just the sort of dull old books I craved so I could not have been alone in these enthusiasms. Relevance was precisely not an issue for me. I looked to Galilee for meaning and to Spokane for orthodonture, and beyond that, the world where I was, I found entirely sufficient. It may seem strange to begin a talk about the West in terms of old books that had nothing Western about them, and of naive fabrications of stodgily fantastical authoritative worlds which answered only to my own forming notions of meaning and importance. But I think it was in fact peculiarly Western to feel no tie of particularity to any single past or history, to experience that much underrated thing called deracination, the, me the meditative free appreciation of whatever comes under one's eye, without any need to make such tedious judgments as mine or not mine, I went to college in New England, and I've lived in Massachusetts for 20 years, and I find that the hardest work in the world that may in fact be impossible is to persuade Easterners that growing up in the West is not intellectually crippling. <laughs> <laughs> On learning that I am from Idaho, people have not infrequently asked, then how were you able to write a book? <laughs> <laughs> Once or twice when I felt cynical or lazy, I have replied, I went to Brown thinking that might appease them, only to be asked, how did you manage to get into bread? <laughs> One woman on learning of my origins said, but there has to be talent in the family somewhere. <laughs> in a way, housekeeping is meant as a sort of demonstration of the intellectual culture of my childhood. It was my intention to make only those allusions that would have been available to my narrator, Ruth, if she were me at her age, more or less. The classical illusions, Carthage sown with salt, and the sowing of dragon's teeth which sprouted into armed men, stories that Ruth combines, were both in the Latin textbook we used at Coeur d'Alene High School. My brother David brought home the fact that God is a sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. I never thought to ask him where he found it. Emily Dickinson and the Bible were blessedly unavoidable. There are not many references in housekeeping to sources other than these few, though it is a very elusive book because the narrator deploys every resource she has to try to make the world comprehensible. What she knows she uses as she does her eyes and hands. She appropriates the ruin of Carthage for the purposes of her own speculation. I thought the lore my teachers urged on me must have some such use. Idaho society at that time, at least, seemed to lack the sense of social class, which elsewhere makes culture a system of signs and passwords, more or less entirely without meaning except as it identifies groups and subgroups. I think it is indifference to these codes among Westerners that make Easterners think they are without culture. They are relative differences, of course, and, what, and wherever accident grants a little reprieve, 
from some human folly, it must be assumed that time is running out and the immunity is about to disappear. As an aspect of my own intellectual life as a bookish child in the far west, I was given odds and ends. Dido pining on her flaming couch, Lewis and Clark mapping the wilderness, without one being set apart from the other as especially likely to impress or satisfy anyone. We were simply given those things with the assurance that they were valuable and important in no specific way. I imagine a pearl diver finding a piece of statuary under the Mediterranean, a figure immune to the crush of depth, throw, uh, though up to its waist in sand and blue with cold, in tatters of seaweed, its eyes blank with astonishment, its lips parted to make a sound in some lost dialect, its hand lifted to a city long since lost beyond indifference. The diver might feel pity at finding so human a thing in so cold a place. It might be his privilege to react with a sharper recognition than anyone in the living world could do, though he had never heard the name of Phidias or Myron. The things we learned were in the same way merely given for us to make what meaning we could of them. This extended metaphor comes to you courtesy of Mrs. Bloomsburg, my high school Latin teacher, who led five or six of us through Horace and Virgil and taught us patience with that strange contraption called the epic simile, which, to compare great things with small, appears fairly constantly in my own prose modified for my own purposes. It was also Mrs. Bloomsburg who trudged us through Cicero's vast sentences, clause depending from clause, the whole cantilevered with subjunctives and weighted with a culminating irony. It was all over our heads. We were bored but dogged. And at the end of it all, I think anyone can see that my style is considerably more indebted to Cicero than to Hemingway. <laughs> I admire Hemingway. It is simply an amusing accident that it should be Cicero, of all people, whose influence I must resist. This befell me because I was educated at a certain time in a certain place. When I went to college in New England, I found that only I and a handful of boys prepared by Jesuits shared these quaint advantages. In giving them to Ruth, I used her to record the intellectual culture of the West as I experienced it myself. I remember when I was a child at Kulin or Sagal or Tolachi, walking into the woods by myself and feeling the solitude around me build like electricity and pass through my body with a jolt that made my hair prickle. I remember kneeling by a creek that spilled and pooled among rocks and fallen trees with the unspeakably tender growth of small trees already sprouting from their backs and thinking, there is only one thing wrong here, which is my own presence and that is the slightest imaginable intrusion, feeling that my solitude, my loneliness, made me almost acceptable in so sacred a place. I remember the evenings at my grandparents' ranch at Sagal, and how in the daytime we chased the barn cats and swung on the front gate and set off pitchy, bruising avalanches in the woodshed and watched my grandmother scatter chicken feed from an apron with huge pockets in it suffering the fractious contentment of town children rusticated. And then the cows came home and the wind came up and Venus burned through what little remained of the atmosphere and the dark and the emptiness stood over the old house like some unsought revelation. It must have been at evening that I heard the word lonesome spoken in tones that let me know the privilege attached to it, the kind of democratic privilege that comes with simple deserving. I think it is correct to regard the West as a moment in a history much larger than its own. My grandparents <coughs> and people like them had a picture in their houses of a stag on a cliff admiring a radiant moon, or a maiden in classical draperies on the same cliff admiring the same moon. It was a species of decayed Victorianism. In that period, mourning, melancholy, regret, and loneliness were high sentiments, as they were for the psalmist and for Sophocles for the Anglo-Saxon poets and for Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.